I would like to take you through the basics of legal dimensions of research uh, and its role in promoting good academic practices. So let me take you through the first slide, please. I'm going to pose before you two stories because I'm sure that storytelling is a very attractive way of getting you off your uh, slumber, if, if any. So uh, next slide, please. So here are two stories. Let me draw your attention to the first story. Uh, there was a sponsored research which was being conducted on nutrition. I'm sure there are many among the audience who are involved in terms of reading such research, engaging as team members or as field workers, or even waiting for their proposals for ethical approval. Now, in this research, what happened was that the research was being conducted on the nutritional practices of children and the children who reported there spoke about how some of them go to bed without dinner. It was not that in sub-Saharan Africa all the families were very poor. This was in the context of Africa. The reason found out, uh, revealed that the child watched his mother being beaten by his father. Now, if the child revealed it, to the group of field workers and researchers who were talking to him about his nutritional practices, and if this issue was revealed openly, he could have another threat from his father. Now, how do you deal with such situation? Whether there is, whether there is any special caution to be taken by the researcher. Now, this child who is revealing that he is going to bed without dinner because he cannot watch his mother being beaten, is a child who is traumatized as well. So when you communicate to that child to find more details, what kind of caution should you take? Can you just imagine him to be like any other research subject, is the question. So what do you have to say? Any of you, if you want to respond, you are uh, open to respond, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the organizers will provide for that if any one of you wants to talk. Let me give you the second story. The second story is the story of a huge project which happened in India, connected to which I had the privilege of being in one of the policy reform committees in Karnataka. So we were talking to these female sex workers in order to understand the kind of uh, uh, routes through which they came into sex work. Our preliminary research across all the districts of Karnataka showed 45% of them came through as children being trafficked, either by trusted member of the family or by some kind of cheating or forcibly. So when we were running this questionnaire, we came to know more or less the data was coming in. So we wanted to further verify the circumstances under which they were trafficked because we were linking it with the crime prevention. Now, one of the girls that we spoke to, when we asked her about her experience, she just had such a bad physical reaction that for a while her body trembled, she did not open up, and then we made her sit down, we offered her a glass of water, and we told her, would you like to talk, would you like to continue the conversation? She was not able to gather words. We could clearly see her discomfort uh, in trying to talk. Now, what precaution should we have taken as researchers? I'm sure that there are many researchers here who are from different disciplines. So, is there a duty and is there a responsibility for a researcher? Now, that's the part that we are going to deal with, particularly in medical sciences. I'm sure my esteemed panel, co-panelists who are experts in this will deal with. I will connect it to the legal dimensions of human rights of every individual, researcher included. Now take the two examples, especially both the examples, for example. As a researcher also I'm vulnerable here. There is a risk that when I publish or when I talk to others in the community that I might be pounded, I might be attacked. Second is, by dealing with this child or this adult who still hasn't grown out of that trauma and watching all that experience, do you think I'll be peaceful as a researcher as clinically distanced from that reality as it is? So what are the kinds of value dimensions that researcher has to adopt. Here I link it to the UGC uh, 
uh, GARP documentation of accountability. Are researchers accountable if they are treating that child or that adult who was formerly trafficked like any other research subject? Is there an impartiality which is expected? Are we really impartial? Are we really independent? Are we free of bias? What is the rigor that we are using in terms of protecting our subjects aside from our methodology? The competence of the researcher. I may think because I am researching and I have the access to these funds and to this community and the field that I am competent, but I may not be really having that competence or I may not be really free of my bias being superior. We have that bias in profession as well, that we are next to God or we are superior in terms of our expertise. So how do we, how do we judge or question ourselves to be independent, including judging ourselves? Second is the respect that I have for the subject, the relevance of my research to their life instead of going on nagging for the data, and the ethics. Ethics I will leave out um, with further detail, but I would like to say that both ethics and law are like the overlapping circles in Venn diagram. Law is minimum morality and ethics is one's own choice of behavior, which is about self-regulation. Because if you don't follow ethics, the consequences may be or may not be prescribed. But if you don't follow law, the consequence of law is very clearly prescribed by rules and regulations. So ethics is something which matures into law. Ethics is at the twilight stage of law in some cases, and in some cases ethics is already incorporated into the law. So something which is ethical is already there in the law, and something which is legal might be missing in ethics because that ethics is not sufficiently being backed by the sanction mechanisms if someone commits misconduct by not following those ethical norms. And the other point is about transparency. Are we very transparent about our procedures? We are telling nutrition research, and we get data on domestic violence. Are we going to keep quiet about it? What are the choices that or responsibility that researcher has? Isn't there a duty to intervene, or at least to report, and to take care of that traumatized child? These questions I leave with you. Now let me take you through the next point. So against this context, the A, 2I3RET, the GARP model, if you look at justice and rights in terms of a fine balance in context, today, today India is in a very different context. What kind of context? From the biomedical science research point of view, the context of reduced costs, collaboration, potential for institutes and hospitals to collaborate within India and outside. So the idea of informed consent, which is there in the medical profession, in terms of treatment protocols and the precautions to be followed in treatment don't seem to be equally being present in terms of research. Now this is where our problem is, not only in research but also in clinical trials. So this is exactly where uh, still Indian legal model is inadequate. For example, the idea of consent is either inadequate or that consent is not taken in many cases because we are dealing with the context of large percentage of people who are less knowledgeable, less literate. So I will bring to that. Therefore, here the questions a lawyer will raise is, what is just here or what is fair? What is having that balance of power between the researcher or researching organization and the subject of research? Whose rights? Which kind of rights? And if these rights are violated, and if the researcher is not being fair, what kind of remedies or consequences or penalties follow? So these are the questions that legal dimensions take care of. Therefore, from this point of view, what is particularly important is the context of vulnerable people. Who are vulnerable people? Vulnerable people are those, or populations are those, who have an increased risk or susceptibility to harm in our context, adverse health outcomes, and they have low social and economic status, therefore their understanding of their rights is very low, and their choices, for example, by subjecting to clinical trial, they may think, at least I have this access to medicine, because they don't have the access to other kinds of superior medicines, because there's no affordability, and there is no universal insurance present in the country. So here there are lack of environmental resources also, which contribute, because there's no direct access. 
Now, it is in this context that if you look at uh, vulnerable population, uh, even the Northern European research highlights and UNICEF's guidelines clearly say that it is dignity which is at risk, privacy. We have the duty to inform as researchers. We have to obtain the consent by obligation to notify them of the consequences, not only in the English language, but also in the vernacular language. The confidentiality in terms of protecting their data, the reuse of the, that data is to be restricted, prevention of harm, and particularly in case of vulnerable like children, the poor, the welfare as well as justice is to be taken into consideration. Now, in Indian context, the list of vulnerable is a long list, and this vulnerability cuts across special communities, disadvantaged sections, senior citizens, differently abled people, unorganized wor workers, and recently the migrants and displaced people in the post-COVID context, sexual minorities and poor in general. Now, it is here <coughs> that I invite your attention to think over the ICMR guidelines of 2017 very clearly have captured the position of the vulnerable and their speciality, but then what you see here is that the guidelines have clearly classified the risk. They have guided on informed consent process, ethics committee review, reporting of adverse event in case of a clinical trial, and the compensation mechanism, humanitarian issues to be considered, and the vulnerability to be taken into consideration. Now, the most important issue that all responsible research dimensions incorporate is the other points. The study, once it is over, the duty to go back to your subject and report the outcome, anonymizing the data and ownership of the data remaining with the subject, and particularly the biological materials, and the consent to use these materials or ship these materials to be particularly obtained, and the regulatory approvals to be obtained, and public health research and genetic testing are to be following the similar protocols. Now, it is here that I would like to invite you to the sanctity of life clauses in the Constitution, Article 21, which we considered as the supreme fundamental right. If you're not alive, where is the idea of freedom? Where is the idea of uh, movement? So uh, looking at life, the most sacrosanct right, we enter the land of dilemma. Isn't health research all for life? Yes. But in the name of protecting life, health being a facet of life, it's not an absolute freedom. That freedom is limited by individual's dignity, individual's autonomy, consent, confidentiality, vulnerability. So this, this dilemma is to be very clearly understood by all the researchers. And one of the bad stories in the past, which resulted in strict guidelines and legal mechanisms in India, was this Swasti Adhikar Manch case. In 2012, 24,000 girls were provided with H. PV vaccination, all of you know human papilloma virus vaccination, which was sponsored by the Gates Foundation. And in 2009, this was a very, very, uh, there were a lot of irregularities which were revealed by a human rights lawyers group, and it brought it to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court clearly laid down guidelines. One example I'll tell you, the girl's consent was obtained when uh, the, uh, the headmaster was signing, or the principal of the school was signing the consent form, among other things. Therefore, it is here that infringing the right to health of these girls, and also unmonitored kind of consequences of that, and the way the serious adverse events were dealt with, the death, the way it was reported, the way it was not made public immediately, all these things resulted in immediate halting of the uh, vaccination program, and Supreme Court laid down strict guidelines, and as a result, we have clinical trial rules and Schedule Y entering the Drug and Cosmetics Act of India. Now, post these clinical trials, there is the procedure of videoing the consent mechanism, and uh, uh, in some cases to protect the privacy in case of vulnerable and minors, it is audio which is uh, insisted upon. So there was a big lull in clinical trials after this, foreign funded trials and all other kind of trials. However, this lull has been removed with the new legislation and new regulations. So now we have very strict conditions of approval, which goes through the Drug Controller General of India and the processes. 
Now, the best practice that we have in this context is uh, institute and research organizations and hospitals. In these cases, the collaborations, if they're possible, it is better to adhere to the highest standard than the lowest common denominator. Institutional ethics committees to be compulsory at the hospital and institutions. And research integrity. This is one thing which we have many a times realized. The competence of the researcher to conduct that particular research, complying with the ethical processes, particularly in case of the vulnerable. So this is where we need to unlearn our superiority as researchers and qualified people. Alertness and documentation protocols, the credits to be given to the co-authors and uh, junior researchers in terms of contract that you have. So the primary legal relationship is determined by the contract and many journals want you to reveal that at the end as well. And intellectual property rights, if any, arising out of it and the data management. So currently, our approach is very nascent as far as research is concerned in terms of informed consent. It needs to be evolved like in case of treatment in medical science. Although we also have a self-regulatory mechanism where researchers and research organizations are expected to fulfill this. I'm very happy to say that in Symbiosis International University, thanks to the leadership, we have very strict uh, uh, compliance. But I also have my own researcher yesterday coming and telling me that she's researching on child soldiers and she had one expert opinion. And when I checked, it was her own father who was a law professor who was giving opinion. I immediately ruled out. I said that he might be a great lawyer, but as far as your research is concerned, it's a strict no. So how many guides here who are seated here are having that kind of knowledge and courage to say no to such things? For example, if I'm doing a survey with my own colleagues in the college, do I have the courage to say to myself, no, don't do this, because they are in a legal relationship with you. You are their reviewer. So you taking any data might be sometimes far from truth because they may try to please you by telling lies also. Or you may be in law what we call coercing, using a kind of undue influence because you are in a superior position by virtue of your job. So these are the nuances in law which we need to understand. Therefore, responsible research is about considering the integrity of the body of that subject and any violation without consent will amount to a tort, a civil wrong, where the person can go for compensation. In India, it is badly developed, it is poorly developed, but uh, in the West, beyond Bolum test, all of you know that in Bolum case, it was expert's opinion which revealed if there was negligence on the part of the doctor. But post Bolum, the developments show that it is patient-centric yardstick which has to be taken. It's not about what the professional would have disclosed in the highest reasonable standard. It's about what a reasonable person as a patient would want to know in terms of material risks. So this kind of shift which is being witnessed needs to be noted by the researchers as well. Therefore, it's a very, very fine balance when we look at law and justice, a heightened duty of disclosure due to the special relationship and to have welfare of the patient in view. Therefore, going forward quickly, I'll sum up in one minute, the awareness among researchers about these nuances is very important. Protection of the participant with the onus on the researchers or the sponsors of the research is very important. I know that in clinical research setting, there is indemnification, there are insurances. I advise that even in clinical research setting where you are collaborators, be careful to see that such standards are followed. Training robust ethics committees is very important. In-house mechanisms as self-regulation to be followed by each and every researcher and guide is very important. And a regulatory oversight on the safety of the patient is important. Therefore, it's a very, very fine balance in terms of protecting the patient and it is in terms of protecting your own organization and your own integrity as a responsible research. One of the problems which I wanted to bring out and uh, our Drug Controller General of India is absent here, but I would uh, invite the attention of uh, uh, Ganga Kedkar, sir, that, sir, many a times volunteers may be coming into picture in research, uh, in research. They may not declare openly that they are volunteering cross, that they are volunteering with you, and they may be volunteering somewhere else. And our technological data tracking is still not adequate. So how do we look at good clinical practice, variants of this kind, departure from good clinical practice in this way, is what I would like to pose before you. The other question I would like to pose in front of you is whether the new bill, which is talking about penalty or punishment, is a fine balance in terms of justice and law. So with that, I leave you, moderator sir, over to you. Thank you very much.